Needless to explain and add, agriculture in India depended heavily on irrigation facilities. Small scale local level irrigation was made available by wells, tanks and ponds. There are innumerable references in inscriptions. That's how we know how people donated small scale irrigation projects on a regular basis. Large scale supralocal irrigation projects were launched and maintained by politico administrative authorities. Thus, Karavela in Kalinga extended an existing and old aqueduct. Similarly, the Chola ruler Karikala is celebrated in the Sangam texts as one who desilted the Kaveri river and thereby preventing floods in the river. But perhaps the most famous example comes from Junagar in Kathiawar area where stood as we have already noted during our study of the Maurya period a large uh, reservoir named Sudarshana. This Sudarshana lake or reservoir originally belonging to the time of Chandragupta Maurya and maintained by Ashoka suffered a major break, a breach in its embankment during the time of the Shaka ruler Rudradaman. Rudradaman repaired the dam in a very short time. This is one of the best known examples in ancient Indian history how a political authority took immediate steps and adequate steps for the maintenance and care of an irrigation project. The period witnessed a remarkable proliferation and diversification of crafts including manufacturing crafts. There are a very large number of references and inscriptions of diverse types of craftsmen ranging from the blacksmith, the coppersmith, the brazier, the carpenter, the bamboo worker, the reed maker, the textile worker, the jeweler, the goldsmith, the silversmith, the garland maker or gardener and a perfumer. There are many such lists as this period witnessed urban centers on a very large scale brick making was a major part of the artisanal activities. Similarly, the emergence of many political powers also required cutting of seals which are administrative documents. So, there were professional brick makers, professional seal cutters. Their presence as we have already said are known to us largely from inscriptions. These craftsmen often donated and patronized Buddhist Sanghas and Jaino monastic organization and because of their pious act of patronage and donation to this religious organizations, they left behind their record, their activities and were from the hailed closely related to the diversity of craftsmen and craftwise activities. The Jataka stories, the Dharma Shastra literature are replete with references to organizations, professional bodies of these craftsmen. There was hardly an artisan who was not a member of his respective professional body. These professional bodies figure in literary sources and in inscriptions as Shreni or Seni, Gana, Sangha, Puga, Nikaya. The 
inscriptions often tell us a different story. It is only in the inscription that we find that these professional groups received permanent deposits in cash from rulers and from non-royal peoples, merchants and other uh, common people. Money was deposited with them on a permanent basis like the fixed deposit we do it nowadays and the guild like organization paid out interest vriddhi with which the needs of monks associated with Buddhist and Jaina monastic organizations were met. This is a remarkable scenario where the professional artisanal bodies acted as rudimentary banking system and credit network. Himanshu Pravare's detailed analysis of the Satavahana inscriptions indicate how this guild like organization maintained a very close linkage with the monarchical power on the one hand and also the Buddhist monasteries and merchants on the other. In this period, one of the best known craft activity was that of textiles. Textiles both of very fine cloth, the muslin of Bengal, the very fine textiles from the Tamilakam area was, were there along with the relatively coarse cotton cloth produced at the central Deccan area of Paitan and Ter or Tagara. Similarly, Ujjaini and Varanasi were also very famous textile production center. Now from the study of the diverse types of crafts and uh, artisanal activities, we can take a look at commerce, another vital ingredient of economy and a vital aspect of the non-agricultural sector of the economy. Looking at the Buddhist Jataka tales, and other literary sources, we frequently come across the Banik, the Vaidehaka. The two terms mean a trader in general. There was a very specific type of merchant, the caravan merchant or the leader of the caravan merchants. He is known in our times both in inscriptions and in texts as the Sarthabaha. The Sarthabaha often figures in the textual descriptions as going from the eastern frontier to the western frontier along with a very large caravan of wagons that carried commodities. But the most important type of merchants in this period is the Shreshti in Pali text as Sethi out of which comes our present day set. The Srishti or the Sethi in the Pali Jatakas invariably appear as a fabulously rich merchant. The Sethi emerges into prominence from perhaps an earlier background. This is suggested by Ivo Pfizer who made a detailed study of the Sethi in the Jatakas. Possibly there the Sethi emerged from the very rich landholding group called Gahapatis in the Buddhist text. Such Gahapatis began to invest a part of their wealth with businessmen, merchants that is playing the role of an investor. They did not take to trading and therefore from the Gahapatis emerged the Sethi Gahapati. From the Sethi Gahapatis actually then came out the Sethis who played the role of investors, money merchant and therefore fabulously rich. Apart from being a very rich merchant himself, the Sethi figures repeatedly in the Buddhist Jatakas as visiting the royal court thrice a day, yet he was not a salaried official of the ruler. Why did he go? It is suggested that 
the city visits the royal court as the representative of the mercantile community. That adds to the prestige of the city. From China, an overland route ran right up to the eastern Mediterranean ports. This is known to us as the Silk Road or different routes of the Silk Road. From Dunhuang or Tunhuang in China, the route came up to Taklamakan Desert, the dreaded Taklamakan Desert. And the two uh, diversions of this route met at the point of Kashgar, where they could procure silk, the most coveted item in the Roman Empire. From here, the route ran to the very major importance trade center in Afghanistan, Bactra from Bactra to Kabul. From Kabul, the route went into Iran, into Iraq, from there into Syria and Jordan. Finally, it reached the eastern Mediterranean port of Antioch. With the coming of the Kushanas, considerable number of commodities became diverted from Kabul into the region of Peshawar Taxila and it entered the plains of Punjab. From there, the route took it through Rajasthan and also Malwa into Gujarat, where stood the major port of Barugaza. From Barugaza or Barbaricum, standing at the mouth of the river Indus, ships used to sail towards the great Egyptian port Alexandria. Egypt has come under the occupation of the Roman Empire. That led to the opening up of the Red Sea network. In the Red Sea network stood two very major ports, one Mios Hormos and to the south of Mios Hormos, the great port of Berenike. Both the ports have been excavated, yielding remains of many products of Indian origin. We'll come to this very soon. There is another major geographical factor that led to the burgeoning of the maritime commerce. Texts written in Greek and Latin by authors like Strabo, Pliny, Ptolemy, and particularly the anonymous author of the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea tell us that the utilization of the Etasian or Hippolas wind, by which they meant the southwestern monsoon wind, ships could easily sail not along the coast, but what is called a high sea voyage, the blue water voyage, from the Red Sea port to Aden. From Aden, they took the advantage of the southwest monsoon and went across the Arabian Sea to reach ports on the western seaboard of India. There is a remarkable volume of growth of long distance seaborne commerce in this period, never seen like that before late first century BC, early first century AD. Let us take a close look at the ports that dotted the coasts on both sides of India. We begin our survey with a port Barbaricum at the mouth of the river Indus. Next came Barugaza, we have already said, Brugukachar Broach, the perhaps the most important port in the western part of India. After this, in the Konkan coast, where ports like Supara, that is Sopara, a northern suburb of Mumbai, Kalyana, once again another suburb of Mumbai, and Simulla or Chol to the south of Mumbai. Then we go further south down, past the southern Konkan coast and Karwar point and in Malabar, the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea speaks of Nitra and then the great port of Muziris, known also as Muchiripattanam in the Tamil Sangam texts. Fortunately for us, the exact location of the port of Muziris is now beyond any doubt with the recent ongoing archaeological excavation at Pattanam in Malabar area in Kerala. From Muziris, we go 
to eastern seaboard of India where we find also a cluster of ports starting from Alaganakulam in the Vaigai Delta. Then we have the port like Korkai also under the Pandian area. To the north of Korkai stood the celebrated port of uh, Kaveri Pattinam or Kaveri Pumpattinam in Tamil text known as Khaveros Emporium in Ptolemy's geography. Further to the north of it stood the port of Poduka identified with the archaeological uh, site of Arikamedu near Pondicherry and then two ports Kamara and Sopatma close to what is present day Chennai region. In the Andhra coast there were two ports Ghantakashala in Indian sources and Kontakosulla mentioned by Periplus and Ptolemy's geography. And with that there was also a port called Alasugne. The Greek texts specifically mention in the Andhra coast an Afatarian or a point of departure of ships bound for Krusikora and Krusikersonesis. The term Krusikora Krusikersonesis stand for Subarno Bhumi and Subarno Deepa that is mainland Southeast Asia and maritime Southeast Asia. Further to the north stands the Gangetic Delta, the largest delta in the world. There stood two major ports, Tamalites of Ptolemy that is Tamralipta, what is present the Tamluk in Midnapur district of West Bengal and a very major port of Gange. Gange is difficult to locate, but most scholars would consider the well-known archaeological site of Chandraketugar to the north of present Kolkata is possibly the same as Gange. So, we can see the entire coastline from the Indus Delta to the Ganga Delta were dotted with numerous ports. Some ports of outstanding significance like Barbaricum, like Barugaza, like Muzeris, like Kaveripattinam and then Tamralipta. These were ports of outstanding significance. How did we, how did the merchants sail in long distance overseas network is revealed to us by a remarkable loan contract document written on a papyrus and now preserved in a museum in Vienna. This document written in Greek of middle of the second century AD tells us that a ship named Harmopolon was lying at anchor at the port of Muzeris onto which six types of extremely precious costly commodities were loaded. From there the ship would possibly reach either the port of Berenike or Mios Hormos on the Red Sea. From there commodities will be taken out of the ship and loaded on the backs of camel. The camels should take it to the very well known riverine port of Coptus on the river Nile. From there the river boats plying on the river Nile would take the commodities to Alexandria where all these imported commodities from India would be entered into the official Roman imperial warehouse at Alexandria and a 25 percent duty is imposed on these import commodities. What are these commodities of trade? We find that as we have mentioned textiles particularly muslin from Bengal also the coveted fine textiles from South India. Similarly coarse cotton cloth from Central Deccan were also shipped out from Barugaza. Spices. Spices were a major coveted item in the Roman world and the most important spice was the black pepper from Malabar. There are graphic descriptions in Tamil literature how Yavana ships or Greco-Roman ships came to visit the port of Muzeris laden with gold coins and took back in return voyage 
sacks of black pepper. That's why Romila Thapar very aptly called the black pepper as the black gold of India. Along with that, there was a regular demand for various types of gems and precious stones like diamond, like pearls. From the Mediterranean side came a large number of gold coins. This is the best index that Rome had, Roman Empire had a regular trade with India. With these, we can understand the remarkable spread of network of communication and trade both by overland and overseas uh, scenario. The impact of the major changes in economic life had a great impact on another aspect of material life, the spread of urban centers. Urban centers, Nagara, Pura, had already become familiar in the Ganga Valley and in North Indian plains during the time of the Buddha, that is between 600 BC and 300 BC. We also knew about major cities during the Mauryan period. Pataliputra, Takshashila are prime examples of this. The period from 200 BC and 300 AD shows the maximum spread, the zenith of urbanization, urban centers of early historical times, a process that began in 600 BC, culminated and reached its zenith during these 500 years. Even if we say only in brief outline, the principal cities in, subcon in the subcontinent during these 500 years, we can see how the numbers have proliferated. In the northwest frontier area, we have two cities like Taxila and Pushkalavati. Then in the Punjab area, a city like Sagala or Shialkot region. Then the usual string of cities in the Ganga Valley like Ahitchatra, Koshambi, Varanasi, Pataliputra, Champa. And then we find now for the first time the area of Bengal experiences the impact of urbanization. The earliest of cities in Bengal is found in Pundranagara in the area of Mahasthan, now in Bangladesh. But there were also other sites like Bangar in the Dinajpur area of West Bengal, then the area of Kotasur in Birbhum, the city of Mangalkot in and around Bardwan area, then in the close to the coast, Chandraketugar, a very large urban center, Tamralipta, a port town. What is very interesting, it is in the post Maurya period, for the first time, Kalinga experiences urban centers in the form of the huge urban site, excavated site at Shishupalgar. If we go slightly inland now, Adam in Maharashtra and Kondinyapur in the region of Bidarbha, Berar, also comes under the impact of urbanization. Similarly, in the western part of Maharashtra, Nasik, Govardhan of ancient times is another major urban center. Ujjaini, one of the greatest urban centers of this time, standing in the western part of Malawa. In the, in the peninsular part, we find a remarkable spread of urban centers. We did not see any urban center during the time of the Mauryas in the peninsular India. Now we have Dhanyakataka in eastern Deccan. In the western part of the Deccan, particularly in Karnataka, stood the site of Sannathi in the Gulbarga district. And then we have already indicated how a port town now emerges in our understanding from the excavation at Pattanam, the site, the port town of Muziris. In Tamil area, there is a remarkable spread of urban centers like the city of Kaveripattinam, which is also an excavated site, the city of Madurai, the political center of the Pandyas, and then the city 
also in eastern part of the Deccan, the Nagarjunakonda, the Vijayapuri, the capital city and also a very famous Buddhist center under the Ikshwakus. What are the features of these urban centers? The presence of large fortification walls, rampart walls, which immediately mark them out from other settlements. The presence of well laid out streets, the use of permanent brick structures, the presence of terracotta ring wells as the system for clearing out waste water from the city area, some amount of civic arrangements and then the regular depiction of urban scenes in the sculptures of this period, particularly in Gandhara sculptures, in sculptures of Mathura and also in the sculptures in Amaravati. These were outstanding urban centers because at this urban centers were combined diverse types of functions. These were often political centers and administrative centers. These were major centers through which trade routes passed and they were vibrant centers of commerce. There was a definite concentration of artisanal activities at such premier urban centers. The story of urbanization is now known to us not merely in the description of cities in the Buddhist texts but also from the field archaeological remains of excavated and explored urban sites.